Arthur Manuel makes it clear, quote, there is room on this land for all of us, and there must also be, after centuries of struggle, room for justice for indigenous peoples. That is all that we ask. We will settle for nothing less. He's laid out what he sees as the failings of the land claims process in Canada, and he joins us now for more on those failings. Here's Arthur Manuel, co-author of Unsettling Canada, a national wake-up call. And Arthur, it's good to meet you here at TVO tonight. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Glad to have you here. I want to do an excerpt here from uh, the first chapter of your book, Unsettling Canada, and it goes like this. When we speak about reclaiming a measure of control over our lands, we obviously do not mean throwing Canadians off it. That is the kind of reductio ad absurdum that some of those who refuse to acknowledge our title try to use against us. We know that for centuries Canadians have been building their society, which despite its failings has become the envy of many in the world. All Canadians have acquired a basic human right to be here. Uh, that's uh, something you don't hear every day, so that's a good constructive way to start off a conversation. Let me follow by asking, what makes you think this is the right time, the timing, uh, to find a satisfactory solution for Canadians and Indigenous people? Well, I think one of the things in, in British, I'm from British Columbia, mm -hmm. so one of the biggest issues facing us is the unsettled, you know, Indigenous land rights issue. We call it the BC land question. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to deal with this, this, this economic question in British Columbia there's there you know like you'd seen right now with the uh, federal government having to initiate this EFRD report because they they know that the British Columbia treaty process has failed it's been uh, in place for 20 years 20 some odd years it's cost over a billion dollars in negotiation okay fees. hold off if I can mm -hmm. Arthur hold off on the EFRD report for now because I want to set that up and give mm -hmm. everybody a sense of what it's all about uh, so we're going to come back to it mm -hmm. but I want to more people will know Thomas King, whose book, The Inconvenient Indian, was uh, very popular and garnered mm -hmm. a lot of attention. I want to read a quote from that book. He writes, since the arrival of Europeans, private ownership of land has been one of the cornerstones of non-native society and economy. Land, to the European mind, gave an individual station within society and was a certain source of wealth. Land could be bought, sold, and traded with more assurance than currency. Indians, through inclination and treaty, held land in common. Okay, how fundamental to any modern treaty process is this difference in how we all view land? I think one of the things is that when you talk about private property in relationship to Canadians, you, the, the people like this sometimes they overlook the fact that when you talk about Canadian sovereignty, Canada claims collectively Canada. Ontario claims that the, all the resources are for Ontarians, all the resources are for Canadians. That's a collective proprietary interest that Canadians are claiming generally. And then out of that, you create provincial property, private properties based on provincial crown land. You don't pay your taxes, they sell your place for failure of paying taxes. It doesn't mean that you own it outright. What is really a question and at odds here is Aboriginal title, though, is really the fundamental underlying title, not Crown title, because Crown title, which is the collective title for Canadians, is based on colonialism. It's based on this racist notion that a white person can come to North America and just basically say, here, we claim all of Sogopmuk territory for Her Majesty the Queen, and now... And therefore they, we own it. We own it. Non-natives cannot continue to base their, 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 their claim on, on North America on that racist notion. If they're going to claim it, it's only under human rights. That's what I'm saying in that book. The only reason white people have a right to be here now is because of human rights, not because Queen Elizabeth in 1862 said, this land is our land and we own an underlying title. That's wrong. That's the wrong way to base it. And that's how come indigenous, indigenous people have been impoverished is because when you add up all the Indian reserves in Canada, all of them, we have 0.2%. That's a come we're poor. That means Canada and the province under the Queen owns 99.8%. That's why Ontario is rich. That's how come BC is rich. It's because those governments claim that. You know, that's what we get out of a resource, 0.2. That's what Indian people have to live on. So we have to settle that. We have to change that. We have to change that. We have to, we have to decolonize Canada. Hmm. How about the term fee simple? What does fee simple mean? Well, fee simple just means the highest form of property rights that you can own on crown land. 
But the underlying title of this country has to be Aboriginal title, it has to be treaty rights. That's what there's a, and that's what it says in the Constitution of Canada under Section 35.1, is that uh, all Canada and the province recognize existing Aboriginal treaty rights, which is basically that fundamental underlying property right in Canada is Indigenous and not from the Crown. So let's go back now. You mentioned a guy named Douglas <coughs> Aford a little while ago, and now we'll bring his report into the mix. He did do a report for the federal government called A New Direction, Advancing Aboriginal and Treaty Rights. And what does the Aford report have to say about a fee simple solution to this problem? Well, he's, he, he, he doesn't address the, the basic question of who has underlying title. He's still basing it upon the fact that underlying title belongs to the federal government and the Crown, and that Indians are claiming land. It's, it's such a stupid thing that Department of Indian Affairs, you know, says that they have an Indian land claim department where we're claiming the very land that they stole from us, you know, like it's so stupid. You know, the thing is that that, that uh, Eford report does not address that because really what needs to be understood is that Native people believe that we own the land and it's the underlying title. It's under fee simple. It's under crown land. It's, the, it's, a, it's like a blanket. It's the bottom blanket. If there's crown interest, it rests on top of our Aboriginal title. And if there's private property, it rests on top of the crown, on top of the crown title. But everybody owes it to the fact that the, ba the base title is Aboriginal. Did you have anything to do with this report? I, will, I made a presentation along with the Nuskonleth Indian Band uh, to, to the Eford report. And how did it go? Well, I don't think he listened to us because <laughs> he'd still come out with this whole question that the province has underlying title and we need to claim that's what needs to really change. Has it come? The whole BC treaty process is a failure because it tries to extinguish Aboriginal title through this modification model or this non-assertion model. And, it's, and when it comes to Indian people voting at the community level, they will vote against that. Hmm. You know, there'll be very few communities that will actually go along with that. I gather one of the things that the AFRD report does point out, and maybe you agree with this part of it, is that in order for any claims to get done, processed, there are 40 different government departments that need to kind of sign off on it. Is that too cumbersome to make any progress? Well, you know, like any time you get the government involved, period, it, it, it makes it very difficult, especially if you're dealing with that many departments. But I think that's more process than, than, than substance. I think if you can get to the substantive issues, the, the matter of process will fall in place. One of the things that Aford suggested that could help speed things up when it comes to land claims is, quote, a standardized umbrella agreement, which would identify provisions that are or are not open for negotiation. Do you think that would help? I think one of the things is the fundamental thing is recognition of Aboriginal uh, title on the ground. I think that's a, that, that is the broad thing that needs to be recognized, and the feds just and the province just aren't prepared to do that. They're leaving that up to the courts. So if they're not prepared to do that, where are we? We're actually nowhere. I think the AFER report does not move us ahead at all. It's not a, a real examination or discovery of the, this issue. It doesn't provide any real new alternatives. Uh, okay, well, I, I'm going to push us a little a bit along here anyway in the hopes that uh, we can learn more about this. And you talked about the Chilcotin Nation a moment ago, and I want to do a quote from the AFERD report on that. On June 26, 2014, the Supreme Court of Canada issued a declaration that the Chilcotin Nation in British Columbia holds Aboriginal title to more than 1,700 square kilometers of land in that province. Chilcotin became a focal point at engagement meetings. Many Aboriginal groups presume the declaration means that they, too, hold Aboriginal title. Mm -hmm. So let's go through this. What does holding Aboriginal title mean in your view? Well, I think uh, Aboriginal title is, is this underlying proprietary right. It entitles us to a right to self-determination. That's something that he doesn't really address in that report at all. And I mean self-determination in the sense that we should have access to the uh, United Nations Human Rights Committee under the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights under Article 1 that says that all people are entitled to self-determination. And that uh, the... Uh, and I draw this back to the Canadian experience in the sense that when the Constitution was patriated in 1982, there were two provisions in the Canadian Constitution. The first one was 35.1, which is 
the federal and provincial uh, governments recognized existing Aboriginal rights. The second one was to have uh, constitutional conferences under Article uh, 37. Those and haven't happened. No, they did happen. They, they had did. four of them during the 1980s. Uh, Trudeau uh, did two of them, and, and Brian Mulroney did two of them, and they failed. And the reason that it failed was that the federal and provincial government weren't prepared to recognize the right of indigenous people to self-government. And uh, the only people that got self-determination in 1982 were the white settlers under, from England. But the indigenous people didn't get it because there was no agreement made at the end of that with the premiers and in, in, in the federal government. So have you essentially given up that the political process will at the end of the day be able to find a solution to the land claims problems in Canada? No, I think to a certain extent we have to go uh, outside this country to seek justice because the Supreme Court of Canada, I think, is incapable of being able to uh, to fully acknowledge the right to self-determination of Indigenous people simply because they were made under the very colonial process that we're getting them to, okay. to examine. Okay, but if there's no justice in Parliament and no justice in the courts and you want to go outside the country, where are you going? That's just what I'm saying. The United Nations Human Rights Committee, you know, the, the first of all, you have the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, where all the countries agreed right. under Article 3 that we have a right to self-determination. And that under section, and because of that, it opens the door to Article 1 and the International Covenant on Civil, Civil Political Rights, which is a human right treaty that Canada signed. I don't know about Article 1, but I know about Article 8. I got that one right here. And that states, that states shall provide effective mechanisms for prevention of and redress for any action which has the aim or effect of dispossessing them of their lands, territories, or resources. So that would seem to speak very clearly to the circumstances you find yourself in. So you think you've got a case to make at the UN? Oh, yeah, no, we do. Like in the International Covenant for Civil Political Rights, there's two areas that you can report to an Indigenous people because Canada has to report periodic and they're going to be reporting in July of this year to the Human Rights Committee uh, and uh, they have to go right through the charter from one to the to the end and they have to report on article 1 but they report on native people under article 27 which is the rights of minorities and we disagree with that because we ha actually have underlying proprietary rights in the land and that's what the Supreme Court recognizes as an aboriginal title and that kicks it back up to article 1 you know, so. But if you win, just in our last minute here, if you win in the United Nations, it still has to come back to Canada to implement the decision of the United Nations. Are you sure you'll, you'll be able to get that to happen in this country? Well, I think one of the things is that Canada did change its law in relationship to sex discrimination when Native women used to marry non-Native people. Mm -hmm. so it was the Human Rights Committee actually that said that was racist and they actually did wind up changing it. So there's precedent that it could happen again? It could happen again, yeah. You're hopeful. Well, we're hopeful, you know, we need to find peaceful mechanisms, both at the local to the international level, to, to solve this very difficult problem. Indeed. Yeah. Arthur Manuel, the name of your book is Unsettling Canada, a national wake-up call, and we thank you for coming into TVO tonight to talk about it. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.